This 4th of July is America's 248th birthday. That's right. The United States was born 248 years ago, a nation that was based on liberty, responsibility, the covenants of God, and the freedom to become everything that God created us to be. And ultimately, the 4th of July is a celebration of that freedom. And we have this freedom because others were willing to pay the price for it. We know that freedom isn't free. Freedom is very expensive. It has cost some their lives. So what are we really celebrating today? The truth of the matter is America was founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs that are found in the Bible. We are a God-based nation from the very beginning. It's safe to say that the Christian faith has involved every aspect of our nation's birth. Christopher Columbus in 1504 wrote his reason for setting down and discovering the new land. He said, I was led of the Holy Spirit to carry the message of the gospel to undiscovered lands. Did you know that the pilgrims who came here to Plymouth Rock on the Mayflower, just as they landed, they formed what was called the Mayflower Compact of 1620. These are the words of the Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, amen. Having undertaken for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith, do solemnly and mutually in the presence of God covenant and combine ourselves together. Only 23 years later, as more and more people came to the shores of New England, the Puritans formed a group called the New England Confederation. And these words are written in their constitution. Whereas we all came into these parts with one and the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity and peace. America was founded by people who acknowledged God as the supreme ruler of their lives. The Puritans realized they couldn't worship God the way they wanted to in England. They decided to come to America for the purpose of showing how a nation could prosper if they lived under the laws of God. The Virginia Charter of 1606 assured the right of each people to live in Christian peace and instructed them to spread Christian religions to such people who yet live in ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God. The Rhode Island Compact of 1638 says, we submit our persons, lives, and estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Delaware Charter from 1801 says they exist to further spread the gospel. Listen to the voice of our founding fathers and hear the spiritual commitment when they write George Washington's personal prayer book. He says, O eternal and everlasting God, direct my thoughts, works, and words. Wash away my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb and purge my heart by the Holy Spirit. Daily frame me more and more in the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that living in thy fear and dying in thy favor, I may in thy appointed time obtain the resurrection of the justified unto eternal life. Bless, O Lord, the whole race of mankind, and let the world be filled with the knowledge of thy Son, Jesus Christ. John Quincy Adams, who was the chairman of the American Bible Society and who had become the sixth president, said this about the Declaration of Independence in 1821. He says, from the time of the Declaration of Independence, the American people were bound by the laws of God and the laws of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which they all acknowledge as the root of their conduct. We all came together to obey the word of God. Patrick Henry, who famously said, give me liberty or give me death, he also said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this, is, this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even President Thomas Jefferson, in an address, he said the First Amendment was created, has created a wall of separation between church and state, but that wall is a one-directional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, but it makes sure the Christian principles will always stay in government. Jefferson even wrote 
in his own personal Bible on the front uh, inside cover, he wrote these words, I am a Christian, that is to say a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus. I have little doubt that our whole country will soon be rallied to the unity of our creator and I hope to the pure doctrine of Jesus also. Benjamin Franklin, when they were discussing about how the Declaration of Independence would be written, he stood and said, gentlemen, it is true that not one single petal from the flower falls to the ground without escaping God's attention. Will the distress of this nation go unheeded? Let us therefore determine to seek his face. And at that suggestion, all 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence all went to their knees as one and began to pray for the wisdom of God. By the way, did you know that the 56 men who signed the Declaration the great majority, perhaps all, identified themselves as Christians. All but one were Protestants. Four were either former or present ministers. And a number of the signers were sons of ministers. And at least half of them had had a divinity class at their university. Wouldn't it be wonderful today if our Congress would go to their knees in prayer? Wouldn't it be wonderful today if our Supreme Court would just get on their knees like our forefathers did and say, Almighty God, what do you want for this nation? I'm sure you've all heard recently, Louisiana is trying to put the Ten Commandments in every classroom. That's nothing. <laughs> did you know that in 1782, the United States Congress voted this resolution? The Congress of the United States recommends and approves the Holy Bible for use in all schools. America's first school book was the New England Primer. It had the Lord's Prayer in it, and it taught the alphabet in theological verse. In fact, do you know where our nation got the idea of having three branches of government? It's actually uh, from the book of Isaiah. Remember, we have the executive branch, we have the legislative branch that makes the laws, and we have the judicial branch. Well, Isaiah 33, 22 says, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. So this passage from Isaiah refers to God as three aspects. And those are the same three aspects of our government. For the Lord is our judge, that's judicial. The Lord is our lawgiver, that's legislative. And he's our king, that's executive. It is he who will save us. And when these framers of our government got together, they said, how can we best organize our government? They looked to the word of God. Now think about the role of the Christian church and how pastors have played a role. A preacher named Francis Bellamy wrote our Pledge of Allegiance. Another preacher, Samuel Smith, he wrote the hymn, My Country Tis of Thee. John Leland, another preacher, wrote the introduction of the First Amendment to the Constitution. Prior to the war between the states, 90% of all American college presidents were preachers of the gospel. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Dartmouth, William and Mary, and Columbia were founded by Christian preachers and church affiliations. John Harvard, a pastor in Charleston, Massachusetts, and of course the man for whom Harvard University is named, he stated that the purpose of Harvard University was that every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main ends of his life and studies, to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the foundation of all knowledge and learning, and see that the Lord only giveth wisdom, to let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret, to seek Christ Jesus as Lord and Master, even Harvard's original seal, which can be seen on their compass today states the words, truth for Christ and the church. The influence of God upon the founding of our great nation is so evident that no serious historian can deny it. I think today our responsibility is to continue to pray for the USA. Pray that we return back to the covenants of God like our founding fathers did. Proverbs 14 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace, disgrace to any people. Psalm 33 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. And the Bible says that God will bless a nation that follows him. So how can we do this? 
As much as I would like to go back to the good old days when there was a national Christian standard, we aren't living in those days anymore. There was a time when the majority of Americans were Christians and those who weren't had at least a healthy respect for God in the Bible. There was a time even where you had to be a Christian in order to hold office. Those days are gone. Billy Graham's daughter, Anne Graham Lotz, she said, for years we've been telling God to get out of our schools, to get out of our government, and to get out of our lives. And I believe he has calmly backed out. How can we expect God to give us his blessing and his protection if we demand that he leave us alone? In many ways, America is following in Europe's footsteps. Over 100 years ago, Christianity was predominant in Europe, but now Europe is a post-Christian, secular society. In London, there are now more mosques than churches, and many more Muslims attend prayer on Friday than Christians go to church on Sunday. And Europe is a nation where just over a hundred years ago, the great Welsh revival swept through Britain and churches were packed. It happened in Europe, and unless we wake up, it's gonna happen here. That's the message that Jesus spoke to the church in Sardis in Revelation. He said, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. President Woodrow Wilson said, a nation which does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today. We all need to wake up and see what is happening right here in America. We need to pray for the USA. But not with arrogance, not with smugness, with humility. Second Chronicles says, if my people who call by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Right now, Everybody is blaming the state of the United States on a president. And we think either this man or this man can fix things and make everything better. That's a lot of pressure for one man. The burden of our nation does not rest on who sits on the White House, in the White House or the State House or the Courthouse. The burden of our nation rests on those who sit here in the church. America, it rests on you and me. We need to cry out to the Lord and pray on behalf of our nation, on behalf of its leadership. It's time to get on our knees and pray. Not a lay me down to sleep prayer or a God is good, God is great, thank the Lord for my plate kind of prayer, but a prayer that lines up with the will of God, a prayer that reaches the throne of God, a prayer that moves the hand of God. That verse that we had up there on the screen, look at the verse that follows it. Verse 19 says, But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. That is a warning. Most Christians today go to church so they can feel good about themselves. We want upbeat, happy music. We want sermons that don't challenge us to grow. We want free coffee, free Wi-Fi, a big kids ministry, and lots of activity. And for an hour on Sunday, we escape the big bad world. But that is not what it means to be the church. Jesus never told us to hide. He told us to charge into the world, to carry the good news into the world. Jesus says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Jesus is telling us to wise up and to look at what is happening in culture, not to conform to culture. Jesus never says, become a snake. He says, we must become wise as snakes, but remaining innocent as a dove. Acts says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I tell you what, we can't reach the ends of the earth sitting here. Former United States Secretary of State Daniel Webster 
said, God grants liberty only to those who love it and are always ready to guard it and defend it. If we're going to guard and defend liberty, we must understand there are forces that are threatening it. Pray for the USA. We need to wake up. We need to go to God's throne with our prayers. We need to wise up. We must be willing to stand up for righteousness and truth in a culture that is becoming more wicked every single day. Philippians says, become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you will shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. The Bible tells us to be the light that is in the world. You know, Martin Luther King, he was only 26 years old. He had one, he had a one-year-old daughter when he was called to be pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. He had been raised in Atlanta and he had attended very good schools, but the city was in turmoil because Rosa Parks had been arrested and she refused to move to the back of a city bus. And as Dr. King thought about his one-year-old daughter, He was greatly tempted to leave Montgomery and to not get involved. But then he asked himself, is this the kind of world that he wanted to leave behind for his daughter to grow up in? And he decided that he would take a stand. Dr. King later said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. As Christians, we need to ask ourselves the same question. Is this the kind of nation we want our children and grandchildren to grow up in? If you think changes are needed, then it's time to stop being silent. We have to stand up for truth and righteousness, because if we don't, nobody else will. And this is typically where separation of church and state steps in. When you speak out, people will claim, separation of church and state. And and the saying is, you don't have a right to speak about public policy and law. Go back to church. Keep your opinions to yourself. But that's how darkness wins. Darkness wants you to stay here, happy, inside your church, singing about happy songs and drinking free coffee. But the last time I checked, the Bible commands us to be heard. Isaiah 58 says, shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people the rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. And the Bible is full of examples of people being confrontational. You know, Moses petitions Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Nathan confronts King David and says, you have been sinful as a leader. Elijah faced off against King Ahab. King Ahab was promoting idolatry and and immorality. Isaiah spoke about the decline the morality decline of his culture. Daniel pronounced judgment on King Nebuchadnezzar for promoting idolatry. John the Baptist said that King Herod was committing adultery. We have to stand. We have to let our voices be heard. But first, it starts by going to the Lord in prayer. You know, during the dark days of the American Revolution, when the Continental Army had experienced several setbacks, a farmer who lived near the battlefield, approached Washington's camp. Suddenly, his ears caught an earnest voice raised in prayer. And on coming close, he saw that it was the general down on his knees in the snow. His cheeks were wet with tears, and he was asking for God's assistance. He was asking for God's guidance. The farmer crept away and returned home, and he told his wife, it's going to be all right. We are going to win. And his wife says, why do, you, why do you say that? Why do you believe that? And the farmer said, well, I heard George Washington pray in the woods today, and I'd never heard such a fervent prayer. God surely answers that kind of praying. And the farmer was right. George Washington put his hope in God. So what, what do we pray for? Well, first, we should pray for all people, Right? all people. First Timothy says, first of all, then I urge the supplicants, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. What does all people mean? All means all. When Jesus came, his ministry focused on breaking down walls, not building them. When we pray, we pray for the United States of America. Second, we pray for everybody who's in authority. 
First Timothy continues for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. What's amazing is that Paul's instructing Timothy to teach the church to pray for kings and for political leaders. Nero is on the throne at this time. Nero, having burned Rome in 64 AD, blamed Christian activists for the fire, started a brutal campaign of persecution against Christians. This means we are supposed to pray for whoever is in charge, no matter how good or bad they are, no matter how conservative or liberal, liberal they are, no matter how moral or immoral they are, no matter how just or unjust they are. We should pray for those who are in authority because God has put them there. That means we pray for our president. George Washington, our first president, he said it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and without the Bible. Third, we pray for our country. Like we've been saying, we need to pray for the USA. Second Chronicles says, if my people who call by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Prayer helped America become a place of freedom. At the birth of this nation, people sought God's help through prayer. If our nation started with prayer, it should return to prayer. And last, we need to pray for the lost. Romans 10 says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Ultimately, God's heart is for lost people. The Bible says God's desire is for all people to be saved, to come to the knowledge of truth. In Ezekiel, it also says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So it grieves him when people die without Christ. He is not wanting any to perish, he wants all to come to repentance. And if God longs for all people to come to repentance, then we should too. And we should pray for them. So, let's do it. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for the abundant blessings that you have given America. Our forefathers looked to you as protector and provider and the promise of hope but we have wandered far from that firm foundation. May we repent for turning our backs on your faithfulness. We pray that this great nation will be restored by your forgiveness. From bondage, you grant freedom. Through sacrifice, you offer salvation. From the state of despair, you offer peace. And from the bounties of heaven, you have blessed not only because of goodness, but because you offer grace. You have given us the freedom to worship, to worship you in spirit and in truth as your holy word instructs. So may our lives honor you both in word and deed. And may our nation acknowledge that all good things come from you. Help us to earnestly pray for our president the leaders who govern, that they will humble themselves and seek your guidance so that everything we do will shine your light and your glory in a darkened world. And may our prayers as a people and a nation be heard and blessed for such a time as this. We make this cry of faith, believing in the power in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope that you have a wonderful 4th of July this week. Please be safe. Please enjoy both friends and family and continue to pray for our country. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.